The opinions and views expressed in this program do not reflect those of KUCI, its management, or the UC Board of Regents. To find out more about this talk show or other talk shows broadcasting on KUCI, log on to our website at KUCI.org or check out the latest program guide. Good morning. You're listening to KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine, California, streaming online at KUCI.org and podcasting on iTunes. Welcome to Privacy Piracy. I'm Lloyd, the show's engineer. We've enjoyed bringing this show since 2005. Your host is Mari Frank, a local attorney since 1985. She's a certified information privacy professional. Mari's testified many times on privacy issues in Congress and the California legislature. You may have seen her on Dateline, 48 Hours, CNN, NBC, The O'Reilly Factor, and many more shows, including her own 90-minute PBS television special, Protecting Yourself in the Information Age. To learn more about this radio show and our great guests, please visit KUCI.org slash Privacy Piracy. Mari, what's our show about this morning? Well, this morning we're going to be talking about wonderful interviews that another radio host has done, and they're dealing with technology, time travel, ETs, 9-11, all sorts of fascinating things that really relate to privacy in the information age. And I'm, it's such fun to be able to interview another radio host who also started in 2005. So we are kindred spirits. And so I've been reading this book of her transcripts, and the name of this book is The Hillary Ramo Show Transcripts, Conversations on Technology, Time Travel, ETs, 9-11, and Consciousness. And there's even a fo- uh, forward by best-selling author and award-winning radio show host, John St. Augustine. So this is really a wonderful book. I haven't finished it yet, but I love reading these interviews. And of course, it's such a thrill to have another radio host. And let me tell you a little bit about her background. Hillary has a unique combination of life experience that qualifies her as an expert on following one's dreams. She has a background in business psychology, real estate, insurance, and even the healing arts. She's even a Reiki master, which I laugh about because I'm also into Reiki and a lot of the same things that she's into. Of course, she's also an award-winning photographer and artist, which I am not. I love photography, and my stick figures could not be called artistic. (laughs) And so she's been, uh, as I said, doing her radio show and interviewing fascinating people and traveling and you can find out more about her at our website at privacypiracy.org but also at Hillary Ramo and her last name is spelled R A I M O dot com. So thank you Hillary what fun to get to interview you all the way from New York. It's great. Well, hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation. I think everybody's going to enjoy it very much. Yes. So you have 20 conversations in this book, and I know you had over 700 hours of recording. So how did you choose this? Because I think about the people I've interviewed, and it's it would be so hard to choose. <laughs> Well, it was very, very difficult, but I have to say that when I started to organize my content, which, as you know, as a content producer, when you have all these podcasts and files and sorts of things, you have to take very good care of it, and you have to you have to kind of be a guardian of the information, if you will, and you have to protect your own library. So I had to spend a lot of time organizing everything, getting everything prepared to be even picked, and then once I had everything prepared, I decided to take a look around me and uh, today's collective platform to see what people were talking about, where people were stuck, what people were kind of reaching out for help for. And I realized as I had gone over so much of my content and organizing it, I knew it very well, obviously, because I had done it. But after 13 years or so, you kind of forget a lot of the stuff you've done over the years. But what I did was I took a look around, like I said, at the relevant topics of the day. And data privacy is certainly still on the top list. Yes. Uh, You also have things like political aspects. I have a great chapter in there on healing the American shadow, looking at it from a a healer's perspective. But I also have great chapters that talk about Bitcoin and blockchain technology back in like 2014 when it was just starting. I mean, Bitcoin is relatively new. Blockchain and all that has just come from 2008. So it's only been around for a decade. 
but many people don't know anything about it really. And so I felt chapters like these would be very relevant to people, help with the hindsight value, and give a really wonderful and entertaining trip through information and the relevancy of hindsight. Yes, yes. And I love that you interviewed a gentleman talking about Edward Snowden, and I just, you know, that he thought he was a, you know, a whistleblower, like I thought he was a whistleblower, and he is a whistleblower, but it's just fascinating how you would get, you know, another interesting perspective on this. So let's talk a little bit. You have so many great ideas. How did alternative media really help Donald Trump to get elected? Oh, great question. Well, at the time while I was doing my show, um, you know, I was recording during the campaign a political show I had been asked to host a political show. So I was doing that, but I was also writing a book proposal for Cambridge University's prestigious Nine Dots Prize. Mm. And the question that everybody had to answer in their book proposal was, how do modern day technologies make politics impossible? So at the time, I thought, well, I have a pretty unique view into alternative media. I've been doing it for quite a while. And uh, the idea of the book hadn't quite landed yet, so I was still really looking at this from a very objective standpoint. So I'm really happy that I did, because as you may know, and so many others may know as well, Donald Trump became a guest on the Alex Jones show. And at the time during his campaign, the Alex Jones show was the top-rated alternative media show on the market. He had the highest numbers, he had the most listeners, the biggest, widest, you know, we all know how important numbers are in the game, right? So when Roger Stone booked Donald Trump on to the Alex Jones show, Donald Trump came on to Alex Jones and he spoke to an untapped audience. Because really what alternative media had bred was a large anti-government, um, I don't know, fever, if you will. Yeah. And, and so many people were talking the talk of the Illuminati and the New World Order and all of these terms that became very popular in the genre of alternative media. So when Donald Trump came on to the show, he started to speak to speak that the, you know, he spoke to the audience. He's a showman. He, yeah. He's He's a master producer, right? So he went on and he talked and he gave a glimpse of hope to millions of people who thought maybe Donald Trump really is the answer to breaking up some of this corporatocracy type mm. government where, you know, people really feel very helpless and they feel like they're really not heard. And so there was this really strong animosity towards the United States government in this crowd. So what does he do? He comes on and he talks the talk and he talked the talk throughout most of his campaign. And of course, there was always the paralyzing opposite views, and we still deal with a lot of this today. So I think alternative media was really responsible for getting him elected because I was in the industry. I was in the market. I knew the power of the audiences. I also knew the power of numbers, and nobody wants to talk about alternative media because then you have to acknowledge the content that alternative media presents, and that's not always the best for you know corporate agendas and all that, as you know. Right. So. Um, I really think that that's what happened. And now we're looking at a backlash of control of information. Facebook, social media was really popular for alternative media hosts to use as free advertising, promoting their shows, getting audiences to, to chime in, and to spread information. Well, one of the things I've noticed that has stopped since he's become president is that kind of free-flowing availability of information that is considered alternative media. So what has happened? I believe, is they've put a cap on it. And Donald Trump, knowing the power of this untapped market, using it the way that he did, and um, the power of being able to trump, no pun intended, <laughs> the whole market, and to really bring it, turn it upside down and get people to elect him in the way that he did um, is not only a really powerful thing, but I think you're going to have a really hard time having mainstream media and the big industries that are in charge of that, admitting that people like us can have radio shows and make a difference and gather millions of people around to do so. Right, right. And of course, there's that whole aspect that he's calling the, the, the you know, the mainstream media as fake news. So, you know, we've got a, a real backlash on this. And I, I think it's uh, going to be very interesting how the polarization that we see, hopefully that will come together with you and I into new thought and new age thinking. We're thinking, you know, how can we bring all of this together so that people are not so polarized with hate and all these things. But 
But, you know, let's go back to privacy issues. You know, how do current privacy and data laws affect people's exposure to information? Oh, gosh, it senses the whole thing. Yeah. It's like the gate. It's like the gatekeeper of the whole thing. I don't know if you're familiar with Aaron Schwartz. Yeah. But he was, are you? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, great. Well, I was always a big fan of his case. And, of course, when I came across his tragic story, I was somewhere in the middle of my radio career. And so I, I brought a lot of that to attention to my audiences because I felt that at the time even we were looking at the beginning of a digital age in a way we've never seen it before. So we're looking at people who have access into um, pretty tightly controlled uh, bubbles of information. You know, the deep web really isn't just about all the big scary things we hear. We only access 4% of information when we do Google searches. Right. The rest of it is kind of locked up in the dark web. And also inside the dark web are huge archives of information, academia, um, the justice system, the, the college system. I mean, there's all kinds of different large databases is being held in the dark web. Aaron Schwartz figured out a way to hack into that, and he, he studied it long enough before he got caught to, to really prove a collusion between the justice system and the corporate system. So what he, pr what he found was proof, very hardcore proof, that the justice system was being written and set up to benefit and protect the big corporations and not the people as we seem to think that it is. You know, we're taught in school that. So we had this really interesting thing happen. And these, this was, I think, before around the same time Edward Snowden came to the surface. Now, like you, I think Edward Snowden did us a great favor, and he actually really did what he could to bring to light the whole data privacy thing and what the United States was building, which was a gigantic surveillance system based kind of on what the U.K. does, because the U.K. has a very, very detailed infrastructure for spying on its citizens, and so we kind of have partnered with them in bringing that to light here. And I have a lot of great interviews in my book. Uh, Wayne Madsen is one of them, but also uh, Chad Marlowe, who is the head counsel for the ACLU on data privacy, and his chapter is very, very revealing in what we're dealing with as far as the realities of this, the lengths and to the extent that these infrastructures are reaching into our lives. I don't think most people really realize what this is because they just kind of see it being marketed as a convenience, as a way to modernize your life and to simplify things, which it does. I mean, if you can turn your temperature down in your home from work yeah. by way of app on your phone, I guess that's a convenience, right? right? Or if you can substitute an LED light bulb in your house and save a little money and help the planet, you can feel better about yourself. But what you probably don't know is that the LED light systems really uh, hold technology to incorporate spy technology right into the light bulb. So what Chad Marlowe revealed on my show was this huge thing about LED lights being nothing more than one more step, one more notch on the belt of the data you know, collection slash spy surveillance type technology. So coming from him, I thought that was pretty shocking. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but well, that's... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all over the place, right? We, we've it's got, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It's the it's internet of things. It's infiltrated everything, Mari. Yeah, it's it's everything. gotten into the point where... You know, those of us who are old enough to be part of the generation that still grew up without cell phones and without iPads and laptop computers, all that fancy stuff, right? We still went outside and we still grew up like normal kids. Mm -hmm. The kids today are having iPads stuck in their face in kindergarten. Right, right. I mean, their brains are literally being trained right out of the cradle to be computers. Mm -hmm. If you think about how the eye scans a screen when you're scrolling through social media, it's an up-down motion. Reading right. is a left-to-right -right motion. Right. We're literally cha changing the chemistry of our brain and how we operate to become so predictable that algorithms can figure us out to the point where it's almost scary. Yeah. And, and the Internet of Things, everything is connected. If you think about your refrigerator telling you, you know, seeing exactly what's in your refrigerator and what, you know, you might say, oh, that's great. All I have to look in and see if I'm, you know, if I need to buy some cottage cheese or what I need to buy. <laughs> but meanwhile, it's watching everything you're doing. And then you think if they share that with insurance companies, if I eat junk food, are they going to charge me more? You never know how all this information will be shared and sold and infiltrate our life even more. 
Well, yeah. we have to be visionaries. And we yeah. have to really see where this is all going, and we have to incorporate our intuition and critical thinking, and we have to activate our deep thinking again because we've been trained to be very shallow and make waves in the shallow end, right? We need to make waves in the deep end of the ocean. We need to really go into some of these deeper things and say, wait a second, what do you need to know what I have in my fridge for? Yeah. I mean, are we really that kind <laughs> of a, a culture where we have to have our fridge tell us what we need to buy at the store. God forbid these things ever lose power. I mean, if you raise a child on these kind of things, are they ever even going to know how to grow a tomato plant out in the soil, the real live dirt? Exactly. I don't think so. I think we're looking at a really unknown territory that we're entering into the human um, uh, story. Yeah. Because the human story is changing drastically, and it's all thanks to a plug. And the minute we disconnect, where do our fa- feelings of value and worth go? You know, when we aren't online getting our likes and we're not, you know, hey, everybody loves my picture and everybody loves what I say, yeah. we're being taught social validation through this kind of rat machine that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these social media platforms are becoming because, uh, you know, you'll see kids that go on talk shows sometimes or they're interviewed and they're young, you know, they're teenagers and they're talking about their alter egos and forms of virtual identity <laughs> yeah. and all of these things. Yeah. So. When you talk about people stealing other people's identity, mm-hmm. what do we do when we've created multiple virtual identities and we've created businesses out of them or we've woven them so deep into those identities? How, who are we without that? What happened to our spiritual awakening? Very deep questions that have to be asked. Yeah, and, and what's happening to communication? We're connected so many ways, but are we really connected? Are we connected at a deep level of really understanding one another? I don't think so. When I see people trying to resolve disputes, and I even have in my retainer agreement that people can are not allowed to try and resolve a dispute that we're in mediation in, in email or text, it's ridiculous. You know, face-to-face is the best, and then next would be Zoom or Skype, and then next would be the phone. But then they're trying to do it through texting, and then they can't even communicate. You see people at restaurants where these young people are just texting each other across the table. I know. (laughs) I know. It's insane. But you know what? It's become a normal sanity. Yes, yes. It's become a normal thing to do, and that is such a good example because if anybody's ever been in a room of teenagers, and this is not against anything about teenagers, but it's a perfect example of generations who've grown up with this in their back pocket, literally, okay? We really are seeing for the first time the, the consequences of growing up like this, and that is exactly what's starting to happen. If you ask any employer who's hiring certain age ranges, you'll see that certain age ranges really do show much different way of communicating with people than the older generations. We're seeing a huge gap in the ages, um, and that's becoming quite an issue. But you talked about a really important thing, and that's social interaction. Right. You know, if we're if we're used to messaging people on social media, and then the, the conversation just goes away, it's just <laughs> done. People just stop talking. There's no real way of moving through the whole thing from meeting someone to to parting ways, right? right. And then when they're face to face with someone, they really don't know what to do. No, they don't know how to really communicate effectively. And and when they're quickly, you know, writing to each other, they say things that can be misunderstood because you don't have any inflection or you don't have any, you know, somebody will say, oh, I was just kidding. Well, <laughs> it doesn't sound like you're kidding when you're writing a text, right? So, yeah, it's a, it's a very different world. And, and hopefully we'll find people that are starting to come back to that communication. But let's switch gears a little bit. And, you know, I, I have to ask you how radio has changed your life, because I know how it's changed mine. <laughs> well, <laughs> probably the similar story. I can't tell you what it was like to have a conversation a week. I only did one show a week. Um, and speak to some of the most brilliant, beautiful people on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. So every week I had this powerful one hour of conversation. And so for me, over the course of 13 years, I started in terrestrial radio 
in upstate New York, and then I switched over to online platforms about two, 2008 or so. And so um, for me, it was, a, it was like a spiritual journey, mm-hmm. really, because over a decade, here I am, for the most part, once a week, maybe a couple weeks off here and there, I was speaking to these brilliant people, beautiful minds, different ways of looking at things, uh, alternative information, people, things that people weren't really talking about all the time. It's like kind of breakthrough at that time. Now it's very much all over the place, but at the mm-hmm. time I felt like it was a very breakthrough kind of thing. You know, lots of people knew what Reiki was for a long time, but very few people talked about it, and so I, I became a Reiki master teacher during those times, and I always felt like I always got on to the, the bandwagon late because every mm-hmm. industry I've ever gone into uh, has always been kind of towards the weird end of it or some, it's not quite peaking. But anyway... Alternative media at the time seemed to be just such a great way to have these conversations, and I felt like I was of service and that people were really benefiting from the show. So for a long time, I miss it, actually. I've been retired for about a year, a little over a year, and then going through this book and putting these conversations back together, I I said to myself, wow, I really had some good conversations with these people. These people really brought a lot of really great things to the table, and reading them is not the same as listening to them, because when you're listening to someone on radio, you're listening to their voice, their, maybe their mistakes or their ums or their personalities are shining through and you're trying to keep up real time, just like you are right now listening to this. Right. But when you have a book, you can stop, you can read, you can digest, you can think, you can go Google something, you can do whatever you want to do in, in your own time frame. And what the feedback, most of the feedback I've gotten for, about the book is, Wow, it's really great to read this in conversational style. Yes. And then be able to stop wherever I need to stop, whether it's, oh my God, this is too much. I need to take a break because that does happen. Or, you know, oh my gosh, I have to go look that up. Or it sparks something in the synchronicities of your own experience that may, in fact, tie in something that's very much needed within the framework of these topics. Right. So, radio changed my life by allowing me to explore my freedom of speech, uh, birth my my voice as a power tool, if you will, for myself, and to find my way to these amazing conversations that really did help shift me in a thousand different ways. Yeah, I think that I agree with you. I just love to be able to interview such exciting and wonderful people that I can connect with. And, you know, and it's not just a soundbite. Like I've been on so much TV too. They always do the, they'll interview you for hours and then they show a soundbite. So what I I love about this is I have a whole half hour that I can really get into depth instead of just a soundbite and really see how people think and what they're and share what they want to share with me. But getting back to sharing, uh, th- this is interesting. You studied Bitcoin since 2014, and there was just something in the paper recently about uh, the head of Bitcoin or something with fraud being indicted for fraud. <laughs> it was just <laughs> in, you know this. I thought, oh my god. So tell us about Bitcoin and what you've learned. Sure. Well, I haven't heard that, so I'm going to have to go look that up when I get off the air with you because I hadn't heard that yet. (laughs) But uh, supposedly Bitcoin was an anonymous uh, formula, if you will, that was given to certain people that were able to figure it out. 2014, I was introduced to the entire industry by a man named Stuart Trusty. He is CEO and founder of WorldBit.com, and he was the head technologist of Alibaba in the East, in China. Uh-huh. So he was one of the people who helped to create the infrastructure for what the Chinese have, which is similar to our Black Friday, which is called Singles Day. And Singles Day is when everybody gets online and shops and buys all kinds of stuff just like they do here on Black Fridays and other Mm -hmm. holidays of sorts. Um, But he created an infrastructure that helped make about $24 billion within 30 minutes. I think the first two minutes of sales opening, there was like $2 billion made. Now, if you think about the computer infrastructure that's required for all of that amount of transactions to happen, you know, seamlessly, without any crashing, without any kind of, you know, default system going on, you're talking about very knowledgeable people who know how to put together very, very, very incredible things. Mm. So interviewing him was fascinating to me because I wanted to do a show with him, but in the process of booking that show, we would have some offline conversations about Bitcoin. And so he showed me how to buy mining contracts back in 2014 and how to invest Bitcoin. My first investment was three cents. 
<laughs> and what I did was I let that run for a few years, and I just watched the fluctuation, watched the markets, watched what would, you know, upset it. And, of course, we had the boom that happened recently in the last few years, and lots of people made a lot of money, and Bitcoin really did represent at its core. I know a lot of people don't agree with this, but I believe it. Um, a way to change the financial system so that we don't need the unsustainable big banking system. If you think about the big banking system as it is now, it's a lot of repression, it's a lot of debt, it's a lot of weight on people, it's it's heavy, it feels slimy. You go into the banking system, you're like, oh, God, I have a headache now. <laughs> and you watch how an industry really is capable of taking over the world and making it the way that it is, and it just really needs to go. Well, nobody really has any idea what to do with that or how to replace it, who's going to be in charge of that, and who's going to be in charge of the new thing. So I think when Bitcoin came out, the initial intent was to offer an alternative payment system that would perhaps release people from the burdens of the banking system. I don't have enough time to possibly go through all of that with you in the short, right. in the right. short show. <laughs> but if people are interested in a beginner's course that's free, that teaches you the basics of cryptocurrencies, you can go to the University of Nicosia, which is based in Crete. And I've completed, well, I started their free class and I have to retake it because I, I had to stop in the middle of it. But it's a free semester-long course that teaches you the basics of Bitcoin and blockchain technology. And it's a really, really great course because you can do it online through Moodle. It's very safe. It's great. Um, a lot of people I recommended to take that who were interested in the subject, and they really did enjoy taking it. They learned a lot because it's written and, and taught the, to teach you know layman people like us who really don't know anything about it. So I highly recommend if anybody is really interested in studying it and knowing more to take to go to the University of Nicosia and check out their free online cryptocurrency course. They have a new one starting this fall. So we have this phenomena happen, this big interjection of, whoa, whoa, what's this? And of course, people ran with it. You're always going to have people who don't do the right thing. So, you know, some bad things happened. Some hackers hacked into some systems and demanded Bitcoin ransoms. And we started to see all kinds of uh, fearful headlines starting to show up. And I think basically what they did to, to really kill the boom that was happening with Bitcoin, and I believe the big banks were behind it, was to kind of do the same thing that, you know, they're saying the Russians did to Trump. It's like a huge uh, character assassination, and they use uh, social media, and they use this weird marketing advertising stuff to really do it. Um, I watched the same kind of headlines pop up in social media that were popping up about Donald Trump throughout the campaign, and or Hillary Clinton about throughout the campaign. So I think they've already figured out how to utilize these free platforms to sway opinions right. and minds. And and it's scary. But we are just out of time. Would you believe that? I want you to, I want to be able to say the name of your book and get your website. It's the Hillary Ramo Show transcripts. They're wonderful conversations on technology, time travel, 9-11, consciousness, bitcoins, everything. It's fascinating. So just give your website and then it's time to go. HillaryRamo.com. Okay, we will keep in touch. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, bye-bye. You've been listening to KUCI 88.9 FM and Irvine and KUCI.org on the net. I'm Mari Frank. Join us every Monday morning and visit our website at privacypiracy.org. Thanks. Stay private. The opinions and views expressed in this program do not reflect those of KUCI, its management, or the UC Board of Regents.